uh, hello and welcome back to our second session. If you recall, in the previous session, we were able to look into the introduction to machine learning. And um, specifically, we tried to define machine learning, you know, first by looking at how Arthur Samuel, who wrote the first program, the Checkers program, defined machine learning. And then how, you know, even uh, Tom Michel has also defined machine learning. Tom Michel is, by the way, regarded as, again, one of the great fathers in machine learning. And we actually saw what we mean by learning. And then, um, and the obvious question, you know, whether machines learn or not, all right? And then we looked into um, the similarity, okay, between machine learning, artificial intelligence, and even deep learning, right? And then, um, obviously, that led us to the different types of machine learning algorithms, right? So we are able to look into the supervised, the unsupervised, and um, the reinforcement learning, right? So, like I said, um, when I concluded the session, that in the, in the next session, that is today, that I'll be looking into how machine learning is actually related to other subjects. So, when we talk about machine learning, so machine learning does not exist alone. So, there is actually a relationship or an interaction between machine learning and other aspects of science. So, I remember when I was in high school and um, my teacher always tells us that if the way you can solve a problem is to first of all create a mathematical, mathematical model of that, I beg your pardon, mathematical model of that, that you know if you can actually model something and give it a name, you, you have a hold or a control over that. For example, if I want to model um, the population of rats, okay, or I want to model the population of rabbits, you know, I can say that this follows maybe like is it an exponential distribution? See, I'm just giving you a name, okay? I might be wrong. Or maybe it follows a kind of a linear distribution, right? So if you are able to give a name to something, you have a hold of it. So that's why, you see, when we talk about machine learning, machine learning is more of applied statistics, if you ask me, okay? Because uh, when we look at these statisticians, uh, they always try to understand data by making inference, okay? Try to have meaning out of the data, right? So uh, if you look here, uh, if I say machine learning is applied statistics, then why am I talking about math here? So remember, machine learning is a multidisciplinary field. So that's why I said, see, machine learning includes maths. So what kind of maths are we doing? Are we solving differential equations in machine learning? No. If you remember, most times when we compute Engen values, I beg your pardon, if you don't understand how I pronounce it, but it's okay. Engen values and Engen vectors is like this, E-I-G-E-N values and vectors, right? So again, we talk about scalars, we talk about dot products, we talk about cross products. So all this, you know, you know, it's like kind of, when we talk about matrices also in machine learning, we are talking about a branch of mathematics known as linear algebra. Linear algebra. So, there is a very classical uh, example of this, okay? There's a very good channel, which I always follow, by uh, Gebhard Strang of, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So he explained, you know, all the maths behind machine learning in his class, in linear algebra class. So you might as well look into that. It's very, very good, okay? So, again, this is information technology, as you know, right? IT is everywhere, right? So proliferation of data has made machine learning more like, you know, a buzzword, right? So because of that, again, you see machine learning draws, there's an overlap between information technology and machine learning, right? So and again, you look at biology. So is it that we are going to talk about cells, living cells? Are we going to talk about organization of life? I know in high school, you must have studied how life evolved from tiny single cell organism to multiple cell organism, right? Or multi-cell organism that has different organs, that different systems that perform complex functions. So we talk about the organization of life from cell to tissue, right? To, to organs, and then or organ system, and then to system. Is this what we're going to talk about in biology here? No. We are talking about artificial neural network, ANN, right? As you know, like the heart of intelligence is your neurons, right? So that's why in biology, we talk about the human neuron, which is estimated to be around 100 billion neurons, or 10 raised to power. 10 raised to power what? Okay, you guessed it right, 11. Okay? So, about 100 billion neurons are there in the human brain. And, um, th you know, if you try to understand the complexity and how, you know, those neurons trigger and fight, you know, lead to, leading to a, com a kind of a complex intelligence. So that's why you, if you take a single strand of a neuron, you will see it consists of your, your nucleus, which is at the center. It has your axons, right? And it has the dendrites, right? So those dendrites, we model it when we get in, in depth, okay? When we study the model four, where we talk about artificial neural networks, right? So, but for now, like, yeah, let's remember that. 
Yes, uh, machine learning mirrors biology in the aspect of neuron, neurons. So where we get neurons and a single cell neuron, like a single layer neuron, which we call a perception in a neural network. So why is it called artificial? Because yes, we are not modeling the human neuron, right? So here, again, when we talk about artificial neural network, yes, it draws what, um, it exactly draws um, uh, emphasis from biology, right? So, and we talk about philosophy, okay? And then we talk about cognitive science and stuff. So, when you look at machine learning, you should look at machine learning from the 360 degrees perspective, okay? I mean, machine learning is not on its own. So, it has all other subjects that revolves around it, right? So, having said that, now you are able to understand that machine learning is not just computer science alone, right? It includes statistics, mathematics, information technology, biology, philosophy, and culture. Is this all that we have? No way. See, there are other aspects also, but I can't fit them into this place, right? There are other subjects I mean, I okay? So we can't fit it into the same place. So this is it. And then the next thing we have to look into, actually, when we define machine learning, according to Tom Mitchell, we actually defined what we call as what a well-posed learning problem, right? So if you get back to our previous class, okay, when we defined machine learning, so we said that a computer program is said to learn from experience E, is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T, right? So and performance measure P, okay? If the if performance of at that task as measured by P improves with experience. So it looks like it's a kind of a cumbersome definition, but it's not at all. If you look at it this way, there are three key words that stands out. We have what we call the performance measure, we have what we call the task, and we have what we call what experience, right? So I said the best way to understand this is to take a classical example. So in defining a well-posed learning problem, so we have used these keywords. So after this is done, we want to understand how exactly we can actually understand this by using what? Example. So the example is a robot driving learning problem. Robot driving learning problem. And everyone knows what a robot is. So think that this is an autonomous driverless car. Okay, we talk autonomous, fine, driverless car. You have seen your Google self-driving cars. You have seen Uber self-driving cars. And why are we taking some archaic examples? You have seen your Tesla, right? Yes, go for by, by, by Elon Musk, his company. You see, he you see Tesla is almost going like autopilot, right? So everything is completely automated. It does it's, uh, does steering everything and even braking also on its own. So if you look at it this way, so I want you to fit these three keywords: performance, tax, and experience into that. So you have three tax now. So sorry, three assignments: driving on public. Falling on, on, I mean, falling highway using sensors. And again, average distance traveled before an error occurred. And another one, sequence of images and steering commands. So how do you fit this in? What is the task? What is the task? And how do you measure performance measure? What, how about the performance measure? And how about the experience? So if you look at it this way, driving on public falling highways is the task, right? So task T, fine. So that's my task T. So the task is to drive on the highway, right? Using what? Sensors, right? So what is the next thing? If I say average distance traveled before an error occurred. If you remember when I was giving you examples of Ludo and even the checkers program, uh, program also, game playing also, you discover that, see, the performance measure there was what number of times it got the stuff correct. Okay, so average distance traveled before an error occurred. Can we express this in terms of accuracy? Yes. Let's say it traveled like, I can see that. So I'm going to write it this way. So uh, I'm moving from, I hope you can see it now. Yes, I'm moving from Mysore to Bangalore. And it is a distance of 150 kilometers. Okay. Now, please listen. I have driven from here to, say, uh, Ramnagar, which is around 90 kilometers. Okay, let's make it 100 kilometers before an error occurred. Now, if before an error occurred, I am midway, right? Say 900 kilometers away from my cell. So how do I measure my performance 
matrix now. How can I calculate the accuracy? I said something. See, it's always good when you talk about machine learning to find out a way of expressing this mathematically. Because if you remember, I said, if you're able to model a problem, then you have a hold over, over that problem, right? If you're able to give the problem a name, then it becomes easy for you to solve it. So I have moved from Mysore to Ramnagar, and I got an, an error of code. Maybe the steer is steered to a halt, right? It got confused on the lanes. It usually follows a falling architecture, and suddenly it's seen a two lane. So it doesn't know what to do to avoid collision with oncoming vehicle. It's steered to a halt. So what I have to get do now is, what is my accuracy, percentage accuracy, right? So this is mathematical term, right? I will repeat here, okay? Okay, can you permit me to wipe this side? So what I was explaining, I said, say um, I have traveled 100 kilometers before an error occurred. So I want to model that, I want to calculate the percentage accuracy, right? So percentage accuracy, I can express it like this. Number, I mean, uh, distance traveled before error occurred, distance traveled before error occurred, distance before error, before error, upon total distance in 200%, right? Percent, because I'm using percentage here. So what I get here is, I have, one, he has already traveled 100 kilometers, fine, upon 150 kilometers, right? into 100 and it's a very simple math which you can do tuck, tuck. fine so you can do this also there are five goes here two times five goes here three times so what you have left 200 by three is around 66.67 percent so approximately it the see it our percentage accuracy is like 70 percent to the nearest 10 right so what have we just done now the performance measure was what the total distance is traveled before an error occurred. And we noticed that, see, this machine, see, is not a very, it's not self-reliant, right? So we need to somehow feed this back, if you remember how machine learning differs from our traditional approach, which I explained in the first class. So we need to take that now, okay, and again, get back to our model, and then, you know, modify that and see when I run this, whether it will improve with experience. So the last one, sequence of images and steering commands is the experience. So what happens now is, uh, I notice that the error occurred after it has traveled 70% of the total distance, which is around 100 kilometers in this case. So when I noticed that that has happened, what I did was I, I took, you know, with the sensors, obviously, and the cameras, all the images that it captured, okay, prior to the error occurring, or when it started the journey, I'm going to feed that into my classifier, okay? And then I'll be able to improve the experience, right? So maybe the next time I take it on a, a, on a demo, it will be able to give me something like maybe 90% accuracy, right? So if you notice here, when we are dealing, when we have to deal with pedestrians and our lives matters, you cannot just leave a vehicle that is 90% accurate to apply the highways because the dangers are enormous. See, it might suddenly break, right? How about the visibility? How about, you know, um, uh, maybe like when a small car just, or maybe a small kid just crosses in between. So we, en we must ensure that this, uh, our driverless car must give, be able to give us at least 99.9% .9 accuracy. Yeah, so we aim at perfection in this case. So can I repeat once again? Yes. So if you want to model a well-posed learning problem, we said a well-posed learning problem must satisfy the three constraints, right? So there will be a task which is assigned to it, on which, you know, it, we have to measure the performance. That means the time in which it has worked perfectly before an error occurred. And then see whether this, when we feed that as the output, as again, input to the system, whether it will be able to improve by learning from experience. So that is what we meant by that, okay? So, and that led us to another important concept, which is designing a learning system. So there are about five steps that are involved when you are designing a learning system. So I will take the first one and then um, we try to exemplify them, okay? I'll give you instances. So what do you mean by a learning system? See, you've seen here how what we mean by a well-posed learning problem. So what is a learning system? Any system that can learn explicitly without being programmed, right? Which points us to the definition of what artificial uh, machine learning by Tom Mischel, which invariably is definition of what a well-posed learning 
problem. So you see that all these things are interconnected. So if I look at this now, when I want to design a learning system, I need to know that first I have to choose the training experience. So in this case, we talk about training experience. What kind of experience do we fit into this? So we have various, I mean, two types, which is direct and what indirect. So let's take the first one. In direct training experience, it's like I am sitting in, in the... Um, autonomous vehicle, say example now the Google self-driverless car, I'm sitting there and I'm driving, okay? So as I drive, I allow the computer, now the, the, the driverless car, to, uh, to, uh, to see how I steer, uh, steer, okay? To see how I brake, to see how I maneuver, how I change gears, how I do everything. So this is a direct. So in the direct training experience, so the, the machine, okay, is uh, like in this case, this robot, Okay, uh, okay, let me say the driverless car is learning directly from the human experts. So this learns from human experts, okay? So this is kind of a primary way of teaching, right? So the human expert. So in this case, I'm the one driving, right? So as I stare, as I brake, as I accelerate, decelerate, and all whatnot, I even honking, so the machine sees it, then acts on it, and with the aid of sensors, actuators, and everything, perceives the environment and says, okay, fine, this is how this man drives. So that is the direct. So the indirect might be a collection of, say, lanes that has been driven before, right? Now, here there are no human experts, okay? So we take all the lanes that has been captured by, by maybe satellite images, okay? Satellite imagery, through satellite imagery, and we feed that into the, the, the computer. And we say, okay, fine. So these are the lanes. So when you see something like this, like this, look at this time, it looks like a slow, I mean, speed limit sign, you have to automatically reduce speed. So you see something that looks like a bump, you have to, I mean, perfectly break, okay? And suddenly you see zebra crossing. You know that kids or anybody might be crossing, so you have to slow down. So in that case, I am not there. So this, if you take it, uh, if you try to connect it to our supervised and unsupervised, in the direct method, it's more of a supervised learning. Whereas in the indirect, it's what? Unsupervised learning. I hope that is clear. So now, that is a subset of choosing the training experience. Yes. Like I was saying, like, you know, the training experience can be, what type of training are we talking about here? And how well is it a representation of the entire, of the entire population? Example, let's take our driverless car as an example again. So in the driverless car, I said here, the, di the, the training experience, you know, a type of training might be direct by observing a human driver drive the car, right? Noting all the actions that he performs when he brakes, when he accelerates, when he steers, when he swerves, you know, and all whatnot. So that is direct. The indirect uh, training might be from maybe feeding him with maybe lots of lanes that has been driven before by autonomous vehicles, right? So, and then trying to tell him, okay, fine, whenever you see something like this, this sign is of a zebra crossing, you have to slow down. You see sign that says steep speed limit, you cannot go above this speed limit. You see sign that says no honking, you should not honk, right? So it's learning based on inputs that is fed into the model, right? So another thing, how well does this represent the distribution? Okay, so if a driverless car performs very well, Okay, the first time that Google drove his first driverless car, I think it was in 2005, it drove from Los Angeles to Nevada. That was in the US. So can I bring that car to India? You guessed it right. So even at the present state, tell me which state, tell me which city in India that a driverless car can run. Tell me. Literally no one, right? So if they generalize this, say, oh, Tesla said, I achieve 100% accuracy. Our cars are purely automatic, autopiloted. You don't need to worry. You just get into the car and it drives you from sort to destination. Do you think those cars can work in India? No. So that's what we are talking about here. How well does that represent this, uh, the distribution? So if I say the car has achieved this much accuracy in a particular area, I cannot generalize it, right? Because the scenario there is entirely different, right, in the US. So if you bring it to India, again, you have to model it according to Indian standards. So you see, that is one also one thing you have to consider while choosing the training experience. And that led us to the second point, okay? Choosing the target function. So the target function, like I said, you always, we try to give it a name, right? So let the target function be sets of hypothesis V, right? So we said, see, we need to map that, right? 
we map the hypothesis okay so that notation we can call it a, a function okay maybe we can call it uh, in this case uh, choose move the kind of move you perform when playing checkers right so by the way checkers is a board game right so i have not played it before but you know it's like you have specific directions which you have to move right and then you need to attack and then you win the opponent right it's a kind of a board game right so it's similar to i wouldn't say similar to chess but again so in this case i want to choose the move Okay, which I have to perform, right? So in that move, if, I'm if I've chosen the correct move, why can't I put that as a notation? So I will say that here, V, you can see here. So V is a function, okay, that denotes that V maps all any legal board states, okay, from B to some sets of real numbers. All right, so what are we talking about here? So this is a function, right? This function maps these sets of board games, okay, to sets of real numbers. So this real number can be maybe like some numbers, like randomly selected numbers, one, two, three, four, five, right? Such that if I maximize this function, I have won against the opponent. Now, listen, I put something here and I think I should broaden it. So when a game is won, so we, have this, we, have, we can designate it this way, okay? When a game is won, we say that, see, the function, okay, of the board game will be um, maybe updated to 100. Is a score, right? Basic score. Okay, so you won 100. Now, if a game is lost, VB becomes what? You guessed it right. VB becomes what? Minus 100. So I lost against the opponent, right? So if you think of this as a Boolean, you see true or false, right? The game is won, yes. So I give him a score. Lost, no, obviously he gets nothing. How about when a game is drawn? What happens? So if I update this, the function becomes what? I map it to, if I'm assigning a value to sets of real number, I assign what? Zero, right? So it's drawn. So no one won and no one lost. I hope that is clear. So you see, this is how we choose the target function. So if we are hired as say maybe the game developer, you might just start initially when I'm in level one, right? If I win, fine, I'm going to get 100 credits, credit scores. Now, if, uh, if my, it loses to my opponent, the opponent gets 100, obviously. Now, if it's drawn, we have to, you know, find a way to break the, uh, the ties. So that is it. And then next is we choose a representation for the target function. So here we choose some, so yeah, I don't want to get into neural networks now, but we choose some weights, right? So this function, we want to represent this for the target function, such that the hypothesis, the hypothetical space or the hypothesis, okay, will be set, will be represented in such a way that I have W0 plus product of W1 into X1, dot, 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 T product of WX, uh, W6 into X6. So my question is this, what does W0 stands for? How about W1? How about X1 to X6, okay? So W0 through W6, W0 through W6, W6 represents what? Oh, don't tell me they are the weights and biases, okay? Now, you can call them weights, but I don't want to call it weights now. So they are the coefficients. Obviously, when we get into neural networks, you will see they are called weights, okay? But fine, they are called coefficients, okay? Okay, of the choosing algorithm. Or we call it weights of the choosing algorithm, right? And it ranges from 0, W0 to W6. So what are these weights now? Again, they can be what? Some random numbers which you assign. Now, if you look at this, so what does the X stands for then? Because, see, the X will be sets of inputs, right? So, say, in the initial stage, right, I fed an input into it, right? And then I multiplied it by the, some, some certain weights, right? So, we can see it this way, okay? So, and then, after that, I take the sum, right? See, you see this plus sign, right? So, if I want to represent this, I can say that this is summation of, I will take I first. I range this from zero to six, I'm taking summation of i going from 0 to 6, where i can be 0, i can be 1, 2, anything, right? Now, of what? Of what? Of what? I can say w i, that is the first one, because here it is 0, right? Plus, okay? So I'm going to add it to this. See, I've used already summation, so there is no need to do this. So what I can do is what? w i x i. 
Easy. Such that, see, it is summation of all this, right? So, and I update this. So, this we call what? The training examples. Summation of all the training examples. So, this is a simple model, model okay, which I've created for that. And after that, then I have to choose the function approximation algorithm. Hey, in this case now, you remember uh, what we normally do is uh, we, in training a model, you normally partition your data sets into your training test, your testing test, and your validation test, right? So, the unseen data, first you will feed the data to it, right? The data which you feed to it, that, is, that becomes your training data and usually your what input data. Now, the ones, you want to see how good this model does, right? So, what you do, you give it a new data set which has not seen, right? That is your test data, right? So, and again, you want to see whether this has length, and then the one which you reserved, you call it your what? Your validation data set. We usually we take training and testing data. So, in this case, we might take an estimation of the training values such that, okay, if the successor improves after it has been trained, right? So if the successor example uh, is a mathematical function which we say like VB of train, okay? We map VB of successor to that VB of train. No problem, it's okay. You get to understand this later. So these are some, because uh, it's a theoretical concept. So remember, we chose what? The training experience, followed by the target function, followed by representation of the target function, followed by choosing the function algorithm, and then the final design. So in this final design, if you look at this properly, you notice that uh, it's a cycle, right? It's cyclic, this, that, that, that. So you might start from, um, say, uh, initial board new problem. So that means the experiment, the, uh, beg your pardon, is called what? Uh, the experiment generator. The experiment generator, before it outputs new problem, which is the initial board game. Right, so it has to take an input. Please understand this diagram properly. See, in the final design, let's start from here and go anti-clockwise. Right, because that's the only way you can go. You can't go this way. Now, we are going this way. And remember, it's a cycle. It continues until we get to our final state. See, this is our final design stage, no doubt. But if you put it as a representation of all the steps, we will have that, okay? Some steps are missing. I'm talking about this. Some steps are missing. Because of space, I'm trying to make it concise. Now, look at it, okay? So from here, the experiment generator takes an input, some sets of hypotheses. So you remember, again, hypothesis, right? It's a statistical term, where we normally say H0 is null hypothesis and H1 is the alternate hypothesis. So what is a hypothesis now? It is a scientific case, right? So example, I want to investigate whether male students perform better than female students, right? So my initial hypothesis is male students perform better than female students. Then I look into data because data don't lie, right? Statistically, I now remember that, oh, oh, female students are even smarter. So what I will do now, I have to reject my null hypothesis, which is what my what? H0. So what is it now? Hypothesis is a wide, is, I mean, is a... a a bright, I mean, or scientific case at an answer of, a, of to a question. So I guess that male students are better than the female students. But after I have looked into data, I now notice that female students are better. So I rejected that. So the same way with two space of hypothesis, okay, as an input into the experiment generator, and it looks at that and uh, puts what a new problem, which is the initial board game. So this initial board game gets fed into our performance system. So what performance system will output? Output of performance system will be the solution trace, which will revolves around what? The game history. How has it, see, we are talking about performance. Don't forget, don't forget. Performance, how best has this been proved? Okay, how best, what was, the, like, if you remember our navigation, our robot navigation problem, how has it, what, to what extent did the robot drive, did the car drive itself before an error occurred, right? So, when it takes a new problem as an input, right? So it has to compare it to the performance of the previous system. And then it outputs a solution trace, consisting of what? The game history. Now, this critic there, obviously, is doing the work, okay? It tries to see, not because it's critic, it will always criticize. That's not what we mean. So the, it now gives us an output, which consists of what? Training examples. So what it looks here is, see, for the first input, what are the training examples? It outputs that. Second, outputs that. Till the last input, which is your what? X6, right? So this outputs that, and then it continues. 
until all the search space is exhausted, right? And then the performance, are, I mean, the search space is exhausted, then we can stop, right? And that led us to the last stage. So in the last stage, what we have, actually there are about five steps in there, okay? I'll read it out. So the first stage is you determine the type of training examples, followed by you determine the target function. Please look here, it's the same thing. Type of training examples, followed by the target function, followed by representation of all the stuff, right? Followed by the functional approximation, and then the final design, which is what? The completed design. I hope that is clear. But why did I use that table again? Because in that, there are also possible combinations, right? So if we, I'll just take the first one. So the, the, the first one, you might have games it's played against itself, games played against itself, played against self, self, and then games played against opponents, games against opponents, etc. Okay? So, and then don't forget the completed design is just what we have just shown there, right? So with this, we look into the last um, topic for today's class before we wind up. So that is known as the perspectives and issues in machine learning. So being a theoretical stuff, I think we can just discuss it, right? So what do we mean by the issues in machine learning? So uh, I, I will just read some concepts, okay? So when we talk about perspectives in machine learning, it involves searching a very large space of possible hypotheses to determine the one that best fits the observed data, right? and any prior knowledge held by the learner. Forget the long explanation. See, did you remember this example? This example, how I said, how well it represented the distribution of e examples, right? So, don't you think the, hype, the search space is inexhaustible? Because I want to, my car to navigate easily, avoiding pedestrians, avoiding bumping into other vehicles, knowing when to break, knowing how to stay, knowing when to drive also. See, maybe even in low visibility, you should be able to drive. How can you represent all the such spaces? Right? So it requires enormous space. You cannot model this even by maybe like using a single representation. So this is one of the issues, okay, in machine learning. See, the search space is inexhaustible. Example, I will take, okay, let me, why don't I talk about medical data sets? So in medical data sets, now we say, see, COVID-19, right? So I have a medical data set that consists of, maybe medical x-ray that consists of how people recover in India. Now I have created a model, a predictive model, a diagnostic tool that will say, okay, fine. Anyone who has been quarantined or who has gone through maybe some months of isolation, they, are, they have better immunity. Can I generalize that? How good is my model? How fit is that model when I take it abroad? Okay, if it works here, can it work in China? Does it fit in the States? Does it fit in Africa? So you see, the search space is, you know, is like, that's why we talk about what? Personalized medicine, right? So most of the, most of the prescription we give are always generic. So in this case, the search space is inexhaustible, okay? And apart from this, there are lots of issues also. There are lots of issues. See, how much training data is sufficient? Again, I'm connecting it to this. How much training data is sufficient? I have seen people work on projects. They say, see, uh, I use a data set consisting of 600 images. And you're applying deep learning on an image that comes on a, on, a, on a data set that is only 600 images. People, other colleagues of yours must have done it using maybe 5,000 images, 10,000 images. Okay, I understand that you don't have enough images. Why don't you do data augmentation? You can translate that data. You can rotate it. You can do some stuff and get a number of stuff. And then feed it to your convolutional neural network and see if it will improve. So this is also another challenge. See, this is an issue. Okay, we are talking about perspectives and issues in machine learning. Okay, actually the issues in machine learning. Okay, because if I say I have achieved 90% accuracy, on what size of data set did I use? I have seen people... They, maybe they are doing some leaf classification to tell whether this leaf is a medicinal leaf or not. And how much leaf they have collected? They've collected only 100 leaves of a particular species. Okay, you collected that and you got 100% accuracy. Is that a project? Have you solved the problem? How can you, if you try to scale this up, say to uh, maybe a data set consisting of 
100 lakh images. How efficient will your algorithm be? So this is also a big issue in machine learning. Now we talk about um, what is the best strategy for choosing a, a useful training experience. See, normally people will say uh, you use 66% uh, of it as your training data and use 33% as your testing data. No problem. See, uh, another people will also say, some people will say, okay, use 60-20-20 um, uh, rule, where you have 60% as your training, 20% as your test, and 20% as your validation. But that is not a, a de facto standard, okay? So, get a, see, you, most of these things happen from experience. Now, I have tried this. Maybe I apply K nearest neighbor or I use random forest. And again, I notice that, see, this is not going to work. Why can't I maybe use 90% as a training data and then this and 10% as testing data? So, you see, that leads us to the obvious question. Is there a standard strategy to partition this? Is there a standard strategy? Does that exist? If it exists, is it generalizable? If I use it, say, when I'm predicting the stock market, can I use it to predict housing uh, uh, costs? So can I use it to predict recovery rate of patients in hospitals? So you see, these are obvious questions that begs for our attention. Now, another thing. See, what is the best way to reduce the learning tax to one or more function approximation problem? Hmm. See, in assessing whether a patient has COVID-19 or not, what you have to do, you look at clinical symptoms, right? So most people are asymptotic. They will have it, but they don't show it. Now, people that has manif it has manifested in them, what do you do? Okay, you try to trace their contacts, right? Now, apart from getting the contacts, then maybe you, I don't know, maybe whether they do x-ray to look at the lungs or something. I don't know, right? So why all these processes? Are they needed, actually? Is there a best way I can reduce this learning task to one or more approximation problem because if i know that these are important factors that contribute to someone okay someone's covid case deteriorating i can only focus on that right so if i can be able to predict this in a shorter amount of time i have actually come up with an efficient model right so that also is an issue and again if we say um can a learner automatically alter its representation to improve its ability to represent and learn the target function See, all these things revolves around data. So if you want me to summarize, I will say most of the issues we face is, how do we come up with a strategy, right? Say when I'm dividing this into training and testing, how do we come up with that strategy? What is the best fit model? Example, if I want to, say, classify whether a mail belongs to junk, or spam mail, or non-spam, what is my strategy? How do I go about this? Are there data sets that exist that consist of all the questions, okay, or all the keywords that relates to spam or non-spam? I'm looking at only English data sets. How about if that is written in Hindi or Canada? My algorithm will fail. So, again, can I actually use one to form a representation of an entire population? Say I have a model that performs very well in Africa. Can I bring it to India? Will it be able to perform? So, that is why Machine learning is still an evolving field. No matter whatever we have done so far, even in the past five decades, machine learning is still improving. Machine is still learning. There are lots of things that we have to still feed, fine-tune, optimize for us to answer those obvious questions. And with this, I will leave you till we meet in the next class. So don't forget how we started. We started by looking at what, well, post-learning problem, getting back into the definition that was given by Tom Mitchell, understanding the key words of women by performance, tax, and what experience, taking example of the robot navigation learning problem. We looked at designing a learning system, and then we looked at the perspectives and issues in machine learning. Thank you so much.